Hmm. Oh. <coughs> I've never tried to just chug eggnog straight from like a carton like that before. Uh, I've always done the thing where you put it in a glass and drink the appropriate amount. That was simultaneously like a really enlightening and very disgusting experience. You gotta understand, eggnog is like one of my favorite drinks. Probably the thing that I get the most excited about when holiday season comes around is just being able to like get eggnog again. And you can get eggnog year round, but that feels weird. But man, that was delicious. But I feel it. <laughs> Welcome to the end of the year, everybody. You made it. You survived. Seemed a little tight there for a while, but I'm here to celebrate it with you in my extremely half-assed uh, Christmas attire. I've actually had this hat since, like, I think elementary school. I think I got it from, like, a book fair that we did that was, like, Dr. Seuss themed. Um, I very occasionally use this as, like, a prop in videos, and that's basically it. M my, my flight back to my homeland uh, for Christmas it leaves in 22 hours, and I'm recording this right now. Um, because I, I said I would do it. I felt bad. I had a really big upload I wanted to do this month, and I got backed up with client work, which is great, but I wanted to do something before I left, and uh, this seemed appropriate. I asked for questions. You sent them. Now I'm going to send the answers right back at your beautiful faces. It's a, it's a, question, it's a question and answer sessions work. I don't know. I feel like I don't really need to explain this. Let's just get into it. Ridley Craig wants to know, What's your favorite thing that you filmed that isn't Uncle Gareth? There's like two standpoints I can I can look at this from. Uh, there's the like quality aspect of it and the had the most fun shooting aspect of it. As far as quality goes, I, I think the former would probably have to be Shabbat Dinner. Uh, I'm genuinely extremely proud of that movie. It's the first one I ever did. Uh, and I think I haven't really done anything that's reached that level since then. I wouldn't say I had an incredibly fun time shooting it though because I was just a nervous wreck the entire time. It was my first time actually acting in like a film and I was with people who all knew this stuff like way better than I did. So I was like terrified the entire time. But after all these years, it's probably the project I did that has meant the most to the most people. Uh, and it was a very nice introduction into uh, what would not necessarily remain a very nice industry. Uh, for very long. So, as far as having the most fun, uh, I genuinely am really happy with just the entire existence of Cyberpunch. Say what you will about the actual quality of the film or whatever, most people involved with the movie don't really like to discuss uh, the movie at all, <laughs> and, and I understand why. But that was 100% like genuine guerrilla filmmaking. We were all like 20 years old at the time. We had no money, we just had locations around our hometown and uh, our, our friends that we asked to act in it. Uh, and it's, it's a hell of a thing to watch. Uh, it's still kind of fun to go back and look at every now and then. I actually slipped a little bit of it into that video that I edited for Quentin Reviews like a week ago. We needed hacker footage, and uh, Cyberpunch has it. The rest of these are a mixture of my YouTube comments and Discord. And hey, if you're not in my Discord, uh, go join the Discord. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun, pretty laid back, small community uh, of people who mostly talk about Smash, but it runs the gamut of pretty much everything else too. It's slowed down a bit since everybody's doing holiday stuff right now, but like, there's always a conversation going on. First one is from Roy Teal. Uh, if the Smash series ended and there was nothing else left to talk about regarding it, what sort of content would you shift over to making? Pretty much what I'm doing now. So while I started the channel with like uploading a lot of random weird things uh, that were mostly just to show it to people instead of to actually have online as like a channel. But then when I started like actually making content for YouTube, I started with Smash Talk, you know? And after that I started branching out into other things and uh, Smash Talk is a thing that I do because I do enjoy it. Uh, and it also is nice to connect with Isaac uh, and just talk about Smash like we used to, and like we still would do in private on, you know, over the phone and everything. But I wouldn't say it's like the driving force behind this channel anymore. It's something that I do for the people who want to see it and because I enjoy doing it. Um, but I've really kind of moved into making other content on here, and I would keep doing that, like, no matter what. Captain Kirby wants to know, what's the worst game you've ever played? Like, the genuine answer would probably be just, like, a really bad Flash game or something. Uh, but I'm assuming that you want it to be, like, a game that people no or something. And I could say like Aliens Colonial Marines except I haven't played it, you know, stuff like that. But uh, I think probably the story that I always go to the most when I think about just kind of like being unhappy with a game that I played and like actually played like all the way through 
uh, was Dragon Age Inquisition. I was really excited for it. It seemed like 100% my interest in my kind of game. Uh, and man, I played the whole thing and I just didn't understand how it was so highly revered. <laughs> Nothing about it really seemed to work all that well. Uh, the writing wasn't all that great. The gameplay was pretty repetitive and not very rewarding. And there were so many like technical issues and just small things that I was just like, how is this not only like a finished product that isn't going to be patched and like have these things fixed, but like how did this, how did this win game of the year? <laughs> now we have an onslaught of questions from Chris Reeves. Uh, so, you know, if you're not Chris Reeves, uh, sorry, it's going to take me a while to get to you. If you are Chris Reeves, uh, thank you for sending me enough questions to make this video worth it. And also, why did you make this video so much harder to edit? First one, do you play chess? Um, I actually do. I was really into chess in middle school, uh, and going into high school. Um, I did tournaments and stuff, and, uh, I, I really, really liked it. But as I got older, when I moved out here, uh, there wasn't really many people for me to play with, at least not that expressed interest in playing chess, even if they knew how to play. So, uh, I just kind of haven't played in a long time. Console or PC Master Race? <laughs> if it's on PC, chances are I'll probably play it on the PC, just get more control over the options and the way that you play it, uh, the graphics and everything. If there's an example of like a really bad port or something, uh, then I'll go for whatever the best version of it is. I still play console though, I play a lot of Switch, uh, we just got a PS4 and I'm excited to play some of the exclusives there. Uh, I play everything. Have you played the Portal games? I just got into it and it blew my mind. I have. I actually really, really like that series. I played through Portal 2 twice, I think. I like the whole series, just from a gameplay standpoint, it's my kind of thing. I'm really big on puzzle games, and they have really solid puzzles. And of course, the writing is also stellar. Do you have a sexy mama girlfriend? Well, I... suppose that depends on... who's asking. What games have you been backed up on and still have to beat? The following is an incomplete list of games that I've been trying to work my way through. There are several more. These are the ones that I've written down. A Way Out, Abzu, Beyond Eyes, Fallout Series, Cuphead, Dark Dreams Don't Die, Abe's Odyssey, DuckTales Remastered, Dark Souls 2, Remember Me, Killer is Dead, Sherlock Holmes, Half-Life, Dead Cells, Valley, Salt and Sanctuary, What Remains of Edith Finch, Red Strings Club, Skies of Arcadia, Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy XII, King's Quest, Kentucky Route Zero, Danganronpa, Hotline Miami, Owlboy, Pillars of Eternity, Mighty Number no. 9, This War of Mine, XCOM, Valkyria Chronicles 2 through 4, Ukulele, Hard West, East Origin, Child of Light, Arkham City, 2064, Read Only Memories, 1979 Revolution, Black Friday. Do you drink alcohol or go to bars? Uh, I will drink, uh, some beer or cider or wine, uh, just a little bit. Don't really get drunk, not really my thing. I'll go out to bars if, uh, my friends are going out to a bar and I want to hang out and talk with them. It's not really my scene though. How is it like to be adulting? Simultaneously a lot worse and a lot better than being a kid. There's a contentment and a sense of purpose that I just didn't really have when I was a kid who didn't know who I was or what I wanted or have any means to do anything. Uh, however, there's also a lot more responsibilities though. It's almost like one of those fancy coins that has two sides. How did you and Pizza Dude Man Guy meet? theater. We really got close when he would see me playing Phoenix Wright or Elite Beat Agents backstage, uh, and so then he would just play them on my DS whenever I was on stage and he wasn't, uh, and that's how we started talking about games and stuff, and then it just kind of really took off from there to a point that annoyed almost everybody else we knew. What do you think of the Copa slash YouTube deal? Are you staying on YouTube? I'm not a lawyer. I don't completely understand uh, all of it. Uh, from what I understand, a lot of it's going to come down to how much uh, people are actually cracked down on. It's not gonna affect me, uh, any major way. I don't really make money here or want to make this my job. This is just a thing that I do in my free time, because I like it. So, it doesn't affect me a great deal. What do you use for editing videos? Also, what advice do you have for new YouTubers? I use Adobe Premiere. Uh, however, you can really use basically anything. I prefer Adobe because it's compatible with both Macs and PCs, so it's very easy for me to work with a lot of different clients using it. Also, it hooks up so well with uh, Audition and After Effects and Photoshop and stuff that it's just, it's very convenient. However, man, if you're just doing it as a hobby, or if you're just getting into it and you don't really have any income uh, coming in yet, there's really nothing wrong with getting uh, cheaper editing software or something. At, at the base level, all editing software does the same thing. And I gotta tell you, as much as I like the software itself, paying $60 every month instead of just getting to own it, and then having them push updates that sometimes fuck with my computer and stuff, uh, not great. I miss Lord Jackal. Do you miss Lord Jackal? I haven't heard that name in three years. How is the acting stuff going? 
I haven't really acted in much. I've been way more on the production side of things, which has been partially intentional, I guess, is where I've been focusing all my energy. I want to act more, though. Uh, I've been working a lot more on making my own things, which, you know, just takes time. As I've gotten older, I've kind of shifted away from being like, yeah, I want to just be in anything, and wanting to be more selective about like, yeah, I want to be in things that I'm actually happy and proud of putting out there. Which, more often than not, usually means being involved in projects that me or my friends are making, basically. That align with the kinds of things that I like and want to be doing. What is your dream character for Smash? Uh, Gino. It's been Gino for... what feels like 15 years at this point. Have you played Astral Chain? I have not. I really want to, but uh, the last several months of Switch games, I, I, I just haven't had time to like get and play. Uh, I'm very excited for the holidays, though. Uh, I'm planning to get it, and... As things are slowing down, I'm gonna put a lot of time into it. I love Nier Automata, so like, having some of the people from that working on it... Dude, I'm very stoked. Everything I've seen about it has me excited. Now we're out of the Reeb questions and moving on to Nompi. Nompi wants to know, uh, what's your favorite movie to watch over the holidays? Honestly, probably A Christmas Story. Uh, I don't have like a lot of traditions associated with, uh, with Christmas, really, outside of just kind of going home and being with family. Uh, but if it was in a movie, probably the Christmas movie that I do like watching the most is A Christmas Story. There's just something about it that I really like. I also really like Elf, though, so maybe Elf? Wubba dubba dub, is that true? <clears throat> now question from Sidan. Uh, not sure if that's how it's pronounced. I think it is. Uh, now that Smash Ultimate has been out for a year, what are your thoughts on the game and the community today compared to a year ago when it was released? Also, who do you speculate is the fifth fighter in the past, and what would you want the future DLC for Smash to look like since they promised more? Uh, I gotta be honest, I haven't really played Smash for a couple months. <laughs> Part of it is just me being busy again and not having that much time for Switch games. And then when I was playing the Switch, I've been playing The Last Remnant a lot, which, um, that game, weird thing. You can actually play through it extremely quickly, but if you're a completionist, you can play that thing for well over 100 hours. It's been partially that, uh, but then also, um, my Joy-Cons have that drift issue and I need to get new controllers. I play mostly in handheld, so I can't use my GameCube adapter. I really like the game. I still feel like it's the best feeling Smash Brothers to me, and I love the roster. Hey, it literally has all the past games' rosters and then more. It's, it's gotta be, like, definitively the best roster, right? As for the community, uh, I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like the community is the same as it's always been. Uh, people get really stupidly toxic around character reveals, and I don't understand it. I, I don't understand working yourself up into being, like, upset about a video game character getting announced, you know? There's also, like, a lot of funny memes that come out of it, and, like, I, I don't know, seems like a fun time. As for the fifth fighter in the past, who, who, who knows at this point? Like, the, the leaks have been so ridiculous. I mean, you listen to the last Smash talk I did with Isaac, like... Who knows at this point? It, it could be literally anybody, it seems. If I was going off of the way that I would do it, I would think that a Namco character would make the most sense, right? And if you're talking about a Namco character, it seems like Heihachi would make a lot of sense. Potentially Lloyd or Yuri, but like... That's what seems like it'd make the most sense to me. This pass has been so random, though, that, like, I I don't know. Like, what makes the most sense to me probably won't actually be it. Uh, they've managed to, like, surprise me throughout most of this. Even when Isaac and I, like, predicted uh, Erdrick and Banjo for E3, when that actually happened, we were still surprised. We weren't expecting to be right about it, you know? For future DLC, uh, I honestly would not be upset if they did some first-party stuff uh, after this pass. A fair amount of new Switch games have come out that have introduced uh, popular characters in existing franchises and new franchises altogether that have had like some pretty popular characters. So it'd be really nice to see some of that represented, you know? If it's more third party, I also wouldn't be upset. But man, I would really love to see a new Zelda character. I'll tell you that much. It'd be nice to see a new Zelda character. Moving on to Biddy now, who has a fair number of questions. With the sequel trilogy coming to a close, do you have any particular thoughts about where the series should go? If there's any way to redeem it all? I guess I should preface this with the fact that I haven't seen, like, the newest one. I've never been huge on Star Wars. I've always been like, eh, they're, like, nice movies to watch, I guess. The Last Jedi was the only one that I actually, like, liked on a level beyond just, like, eh, it's fun, you know? Uh, that was the first one where I was, like, this, like, was, was something. Like, so that was, that was cool. I'm hearing not great things about Rise of Skywalker. It sounds like a lot of the stuff that I was thinking would happen, just because of who J.J. Abrams is as a filmmaker. Like, the stuff that... Seeing what he did with The Force Awakens, and then just knowing what he does. Uh, and then seeing that, like, the, the BVS writer was on it and everything. I'm not really expecting it to have very much for me. Uh, which is fine. 
Uh, I think one of the things that people need to realize when they interact with media is that not everything is targeted at them, you know? I've seen a couple people talking about Rise of Skywalker making them really happy and stuff like, you know, fuck the haters and like, how can anybody say this is bad? And it's like, to them it very well might be, you know? Like, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that people like uh, in movies that doesn't work for me, and vice versa. There's stuff that I love about movies that uh, tend, to, tend to piss people off. Any kind of art is really just a form of communication. Sure, it depends on their ability to craft it and everything, but what you're gonna think of it depends just as much on your own baggage and uh, your own language and the way that you see things and the way that you think um, and all of that stuff. So, like, the idea of, like, how can anybody think this? It's, well, they have a different background or are looking for uh, different things than you. That's the answer to pretty much any of it. As far as, like, redeeming it, I don't think it really needs to be redeemed. I mean, that's the stuff people were saying after the prequels. You know? They're still making crazy money. People are still going and seeing it. And it's still serving one of its primary functions, which is to create iconic uh, characters and set pieces and stuff to sell toys of. You know? They've still got the game coming out. I'm sure the game's going to sell well as well. Uh, the series is doing well. None of these movies have done badly. When people are trying to say, like, oh, look at how bad the sales on The Last Jedi were, it's like, it really weren't, though. Like, they, they really weren't. I know what I would like to see Star Wars become, and I know what I would like to see happen. I'm also fully prepared for it to never happen, because it's extremely likely that Star Wars is just not a series where the creators uh, of it, people in, in, in charge of, like, making Star Wars stuff, uh, are ever going to be on the same wavelength as me, because I don't think I'm really going to be their target demographic. Eh, it's fine. It's just kind of the way it is. But the only true answer is they need to have Bong Joon-ho, uh, as a as solo director and writer, uh, adapt the entire Thrawn trilogy by Timothy Zahn uh, into a trilogy of movies. That would be... That would be tight. Do you guys have any particular plans for the Miles arc, or will Miles finally get the spin-off he deserves? I assume you're talking about, uh, with the Isaac's Four Smash series? Oh, uh, it was one thing I was actually talking about with him, is we didn't expect it to become a continuing, like, running joke, but just as things have come up, uh, we've just had ideas and spitballed them back and forth, and been like, this would be a funny joke. When we shot that skip for Katamari, like, we didn't really have a plan until we were shooting it, and we just kind of kept adding things. And then with the Tails one, we just, like, we're like, we should probably make a joke, just because, like, this character is named Miles, so, like, we should do something, right? And so Miles came over, and we threw that together. That, that's basically it. So there's no, like, long-term plans for it, but I would like to see how it develops. I would love for us to actually, like, make a compelling, like, story arc out of this bizarre joke in a, in a, in a Smash moveset series. Uh, I'd love to see that come to fruition. As a year in review, what was it like for you and what are your hopes for next year? Like, projects, life, etc. See, here's the thing. Um, that was kind of what the video I was initially going to do this month was supposed to be. It was supposed to be like a decade in review thing, and it's going to be something that I do next month now. I was like, this month, I'm going to be dedicating my free time to that. And then, three clients came to me with jobs that I was not expecting, and uh, a lot of those jobs kept expanding in scope. And uh, that free time that I was going to make that video with ceased to exist. This right now, uh, I'm making in between trying to finish up the last couple things that I have to do before I go home in what is now 21 and a half hours. So I'm squeezing this in between the work that I'm still trying to do, and this is a very fast and low effort video, all things considered. But to cover it briefly, uh, mentally this was like a really tough year. It's been a lot of coming to grips with uh, issues that I've put off for a bit and everything. In a lot of ways it was very trying. Had some very high highs, very low lows. From a production standpoint, I think this is when I started really establishing my identity as like a freelance like producer and editor and stuff and started like really making good recurring clients so i think that bodes really well going into next year in terms of getting to live more comfortably and make more of a steady income off of the work that i do and produce work for my clients that i'm happier with um so that's great it's something that i'll talk about more next month uh in depth if you had to pick a game of the decade what would it be and why oh don't do me like that I think I would go with Nier Automata because I feel like Nier Automata took a lot of the things that were happening in this decade 
in sort of just pushing what games could be as a storytelling medium. There are other games that did it as well, I'm not trying to like put down anything else. Uh, there, you know, there are games like Hellblade that also did tremendous narrative. I mean, okay, narratively I could go on for a long time about several games, uh, but I feel like Nier Automata is the one that I think has most exclusively defined games as a extremely unique art form for me, uh, in that it still is extremely gamey. Um, I do love a lot of games that are, like, very light on gameplay. Uh, I think that a lot of criticism of them is is dumb. Um, it, there's still games and all that. But Nier Automata has the, the veneer and all the complexity of a actually kind of mechanically intensive game. Uh, while still also wrapping it up in meta-narrative and having something to say and kind of pushing the cinematic storytelling as well as uh, telling the story in, in ways that a movie never could do. That's like the shining example for me of like, this is the direction that I want to see more games going. I want games to be going in all directions, honestly, but like Nier Automata, like, I I'm really excited to just see how Yoko Taro is going to keep exploring this medium. So that's just going off of like that criteria. You can go off a lot of other criteria. Like if you're talking about like most influential, that'd have to be like Minecraft, right? But I think for me personally, uh, the game that had me the most excited about games and where they've been and where they can go, I think it would be Nier Automata. If you could describe the past decade of your life, what would it be? That's literally the pitch of my next video, so I'm not gonna discuss that here. And lastly, why weren't you in elf practice? I actually really do like those movies. Maybe I should have said that for the Christmas movies one. I really do like the Rankin Bass claymation stuff. Moving into PSB123, who do you think owns Octavo from Cadence of Hyrule? Nintendo or the developers of Crypt of the Necrodancer? Uh, probably the indie devs. If we're talking about how Geno is owned by Square and stuff like that, it seems like Nintendo would have less of a controlling stake in Crypt of the Necrodancer than they would have in Super Mario RPG, you know? Uh, considering that Cadence of Hyrule was basically a Nintendo-themed extension of an existing game, I'd imagine that original characters and stuff would belong to the indie devs. But I'm also not a lawyer, and specifically, not a games lawyer. If Cadence were to become playable in Smash Bros, how much do you think the Zelda series would influence her moveset because of Cadence of Hyrule? Probably not a whole lot, maybe like a, a cute little cheeky reference here or there, but I think it would mostly be the own original uh, kind of rhythm game stuff, because she would be the first rhythm game character, you know? Uh, so I think it would be really focused on that, the variety of weapons that she uses, uh, that sort of thing. We're moving into two questions from Jason now. What are your thoughts on the Todd Howard video now that it's your most viewed, or do you really not care? It's been surreal and it's kind of really driven in that irony that like, I can spend a very long time working on a video that I care a lot about, and it'll get like 500 views. And then I can just make a shit post uh, out of a funny thing that I thought of one time, uh, that I literally just made to, uh, to, to, to post it and then have my, my friends on Discord go like, why did you do this? Uh, and that can suddenly blow up and get more than a thousand times the views of the thing that I made that means a lot to me and uh, has like a lot of my soul in it and is the kind of thing that I want to leave in this world. That said, I do enjoy making stuff like that and I am working on the sequel. When making stuff for your personal channels, have you ever struggled with deciding between making what you want to make versus what you feel you need to make slash what viewers want you to make? Uh, earlier on, I definitely did. Uh, back when I was first doing the initial Smash Talk and stuff, I did have, like, dreams of being, like, a YouTuber or whatever. Because, you know, back then, like, it just seemed like the perfect job. Because, uh, part of it was definitely me being younger, but it was also just that it was less of a developed industry at that point, so nobody really knew what it was going to be back in the early 2010s, you know? I'm at a point now where I'm much more concerned with, uh, kind of sticking to the things that matter to me and putting out stuff that I can be proud of and stuff that, uh... I'm willing to stand behind. And it's not that I don't stand behind Smash Talk or whatever, but I just get a much different feeling out of putting out something like the uh, the Life Aquatic video, and every now and then having somebody come across it, and like saying like, hey, I've been watching this video and it made me think about, you know, my brother that died a year ago, and I found this video, and it like, and just like having like those conversations with people come out of nowhere, because you opened yourself up and were vulnerable and were like, hey, Art and media can be like a really wonderful thing. Let's talk about it. And you just get to have like these really interesting conversations that you didn't expect to have. Um, and so I'm much more interested in making stuff like that. That's much more fulfilling to me. Um, so I genuinely don't have any like concerns over 
making what my audience wants to see necessarily. Let me rephrase that. It's not that I don't want to make things you guys want to see. It's that I want to make my videos in a way that whoever I think would need to hear it can most easily uh, watch and take it in and process it, basically. So I want to choose the editing style and the music and the tone that I think best matches what it is that I'm trying to put out there. And so that's where my main concern and my main stress comes over. It's never really over like, ah, is this gonna get views? I expect nothing that I make to get views at this point. Most things don't. The two things that I've had blow up were complete surprises. And like I said earlier, I'm not trying to make a living off of this. I've got a Patreon open for people who do want to support this, and I feel so much better about that because it feels like, hey, any support that I'm getting is coming entirely through people going like, hey, I like your stuff and I want to support it. Uh, as opposed to, you know, if I was doing it off of bad sense, I would feel guilty over feeling like, am I just making things to try and drive a bad sense or something like that? So I have no interest in pursuing like that side of YouTube. So I, I don't really, I don't really think about that. Then we got a question here from Joe MC. When making videos with more thought and effort put into them, like the Paranorman video, what's your creative process for said videos? So the Paranorman video and the other videos in that series, what I'm calling like the Finding Film series, uh, which I didn't put out any this year uh, for reasons that I'll get into next month. Um, those are actually a very bizarre creative process where it's literally nothing is scripted and it's just... The, you know, the first one, the Life Aquatic one, was just me. I would literally just watched Life Aquatic again that night and I was like, I just want to talk about this. So I turned on the mic and I just rambled. And I took like that half hour of voiceover and cut it down into a video. And then the rest of the videos since then have just been when I know that a movie means something particularly special to somebody in a way that I don't particularly understand or that isn't my take on it basically. Uh, I'm just like, hey, do you want to do this? And I have them come and sit in the room and they just talk about it. And I'll ask a question every now and then, but for the most part, it's just them talking about what they like. I try not to lead them. I'll ask for questions to like round out a segment if I'm like, you touched on this thing and then you got distracted and went on a different tangent. Can you go back to this thing for a bit? I'll do that, like when they're done talking. But uh, for the most part, I just have them talk and then I take however much audio there is. Like the Paranorman one was like 45, 50 minutes of, of voiceover. <laughs> the big thing about producing a project is that the, the more pre-production you do, the, the less headaches you have in production and post-production. Uh, although production is super easy, uh, for these videos. Post-production is a nightmare, because since it's unscripted, and since uh, it's not even really lead, and I want it to just feel natural, uh, basically I'm just pulling bits from everywhere and trying to put a narrative together out of them. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, sometimes the editing process will be weeks because it'll just be me listening to the audio over and over again and listening for like where the hook's at and how I can combine these things together. So that's that creative process. It's uh, Those ones specifically, are a zero pre-production, very light production, entirely post-production, how do I best showcase what this person was willing to share? Um, it's an interesting exercise. Uh, it takes time, but it's also some of the most rewarding stuff I've done on the channel, I think. And then we got one final question from Isaac himself, pizza dude man guy. Uh, favorite projects from throughout your life, uh, whether they got finished or not. There was a movie that I filmed years ago, that I acted in, I should say. I wasn't involved in production called Stranger Than Nixon. I, I still think it's possible that it's the best comedic acting I've done. It was just a very bizarre movie that was 100% up my alley, and it felt like the kind of thing where I was like, I'm the right person to play this, and I don't think many people would be the right person to play this. I have a rough of it. The process just kind of stopped at a certain point in post-production. It was extremely close to releasing, and I still think about it uh, very often. I really want to see that movie actually get like the light of day, but at this point I'm not, I'm not expecting it. And I also really got to shout out Uncle Gareth. It was an extremely stressful time, and in a lot of ways it has been very hard. There are a lot of lows and a lot of highs in the in the entire like eight month process of making it. Uh, and then I've been doing the festival run since, and we're honestly getting pretty close to wrapping that up. And I guess I'll start thinking about how we're going to release it online and all that. It stressed me out and it's definitely one of the things that crippled me creatively for a while because I would just get incredibly stressed about it and living up to the expectations of all the people that helped me out with it and everything and 
Uh, it's... Uh, I could probably make a whole video just talking about the process of making that. Um, I'm extremely proud of it, and it was probably one of my biggest growth moments in my entire life, honestly. Just the process of doing that whole thing. And then there's the feature that I'm trying to make that I'm working on that script has been phenomenal. I will make that movie. It's just figuring out exactly how. Man, I just I'm just like thinking back through like all these all these things that I should really save to talk about next month. Um, but there's there, there there's a lot in there. I'm very excited. I also want to shout out the Phoenix Wright voiceover project uh, that I did with Isaac and a bunch of my friends back home. We had no idea what we were doing. And we recorded dozens of hours of voiceover that were actually videos that he had saved on his computer because uh, he didn't know how else to record them at that point. We had no idea what we were doing. Absolutely no idea. And we voice acted the entirety of all three Phoenix Wright like games. And we only got like six or seven of the episodes out. But like the process of making that, just the pure chaos of it, the sheer amount of organization that went in, just everything that we did, even though it didn't completely pay off. Uh, that was like my first time like really trying to make something like big. We were so young, goddamn. That's all the questions. I'm gonna start cutting this together, I guess, and try to get a rough together and then sleep for a couple hours and do whatever extra editing has to be done to try and get this as good as possible before I have to leave. Thank you for sticking with this channel. It was quiet for a majority of the year for a lot of reasons. Um, I really wanted to get that video out to you guys this month, but it's a, it's a video that I want to do right, you know? And so I think not rushing it right now and then giving myself like the break while I'm, while I'm home for the holidays to just recharge and really think it through, like how exactly I'm going to do every step of this. I think it'll be a really cool thing. I'm really excited to make it. For all of you watching, old and new, um, the people who have been here since since I was doing Smash Talk, which is close to a decade ago. You basically spent this decade watching me go through so many phases on YouTube, making so many different kinds of content, being so many different kinds of douchebag, uh, before settling into something that I, I, I hope I'm much less of a douchebag now. Uh, I feel like I've reached a more genuine, uh, wholesome place by this point. Uh, it only took me until 27. I appreciate you guys being here and having an audience at all. Uh, and for the new people that got here through the Quentin Reviews video, or any of the people who are constantly finding me through other weird small videos like the Todd Howard one, or Life Aquatic, or Who's Line, um, welcome. Uh, feel free to look through the channel, preferably only the more recent ones, uh, if you want to get, like, an actual idea of what I can actually put out. Maybe not the Smash Talks, those are a very specific thing for a very specific part of my audience, and they're definitely not going to be for everybody. I want to make a lot more stuff next year and I think I'm getting into a better headspace to do it. And I think this is a step in that direction, getting this Q&A out, actually just getting a video out, despite everything going on. Oh, and if you're looking for something to do over the holidays, uh, starting on the 26th and then going through the 6th of January, I believe, we're gonna be doing a marathon of, uh, of our D&D show, The Natural Ones, over on Twitch. Uh, it's gonna be an episode every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, although all the episodes, like, are there, if you want to just watch them uh, at any point, they're on the channel. But uh, yeah, if any of you are curious and want to actually watch it being streamed live for whatever reason, uh, go check that stuff out if you like D&D. &D. Uh, we've built up to a really cool place in the campaign, I think, and I'm very excited for where it's going. There's been, like, obviously some growing pains as we figured out how to do this several hour long show every week. Uh, but it's been a really fun process to try and, like, streamline and figure out like how do you make something like this work like how do you produce one of these things and make it better than the average one of these because there's a lot of them but you know how do you how do you push this and i think that we've done a couple things that uh that make this show special with that i'm gonna go ahead and start the editing process thank you again to everybody that's watching uh and uh have yourselves a merry little christmas or a happy little hanukkah or a crazy little kwanzaa just in general just a just a happy holiday uh, even if even if the holidays aren't a special time to you, uh, just taking a little time to take care of yourself uh, never really hurt anybody. That's probably a lie, but like, I dare you to call me on it. <laughs>